Welcome, everybody. This is still a part of us. It's a place where moms and dads um, get to talk about their kids that have died either in stillbirth or in infant loss. So we are so grateful to be back here with Miranda. She told the story of her son, George, and we're going to talk to her a little bit more today about some things that she's experienced as she has grieved his loss. And once again, I am Winter, and I want to just do a really quick warning of that we're going to be talking about stillbirth today, and it is full of triggers. So please just be healthy and be safe. So if you need to not listen to this episode, please do not listen to this episode. We just want everybody to be safe. So and if you are joining us as a lost mom or a lost dad, welcome. We're sorry that you're part of this club that nobody wants to be a part of. If you um, feel the desire to subscribe to help others find other stories and hit the subscribe button and, and we can help each other out and, and support each other. So Miranda, thank you again so much for coming on today. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about George and your experience in the UK as having lost him about, about 10 months ago, 11 months ago, right? at the time yes, of this recording. Right. So yeah. thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been good to talk about him. Yeah, good. I'm glad. And um, just for a little bit of context, so it was about 11 months ago. What what happened to George? What How far along were you when he passed away? Yeah, so I found out that um, George had no heartbeat when I was 39 weeks and one day pregnant. Um so I was, we were ready to meet him. We were in the home stretch. It was my very first day of maternity leave when we got the devastating news that his heart had just unexpectedly stopped. Yeah. Please go listen to her birth, the birth episode of George, because I, I just can think of all these terrible things that were, I mean, all of these terrible things that happened to Miranda, but it was also compounded with the COVID pandemic and all of those wonderful things that come along with it, right? It's, wor it's worth a listen. So if you can jump over there, please do. So Miranda, I know that you mentioned before in your other episode that after George passed away, you and your husband, Graham, basically escaped a little bit. You guys didn't go back to your flat in the UK, um, in London, and you just ended up going to, you stayed in a hotel for a few days, and then you were in Edinburgh for a couple months. And you made a point to say that Graham basically took care of you. That's true. I, I sometimes joke that, you know, I became the infant. Um, you know, I was waking up at night crying. Um, you know, I needed to be fed my breakfast and, you know, told when to, when to have a nap, you know. It was, yeah. You know, I was afraid of the dark. I, I really, you know, turned a bit, you know, childlike myself. And he, he really did take care of me. Um, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have got out of bed. I wouldn't have fed myself properly. I don't know how long it would have been until I did, but he really, I mean, he, he saved me in a way. Um, you know, not only did he make sure I took care of myself, but he did things and arranged things to make sure that, you know, we were taking care of our mental health. And I think escaping was perhaps one of the best things we did. Um, you know, although it was lonely, there was a certain comfort in being anonymous where we were. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that we did, um, I don't know if anyone who's listening has been to Scotland or to Edinburgh, but it was summertime. So, you know, arguably the best time to be there. And we just did beautiful walks in nature. We climbed mountains. Uh, you know, as my physical recovery started getting better, we, you know, we picked big mountains to climb, you know, full day hikes. And I think, you know, when everything else in your life feels like a complete failure, there was something really uplifting about doing something that felt like an accomplishment yeah and honestly if it wasn't for Graham finding those mountains to climb you know finding the directions driving us there planning it all there's no way I would have done any of it and honestly I owe him such gratitude for just not giving up on me during that time he was he was the only thing that kept me going yeah, it's amazing. Like, especially those, oh, it's just, it's so, the pain is so acute <laughs> in those early days and you just, you really don't know how to function. I just, yeah, I remember thinking like, I was pretty proud of myself when we got out of bed and had something nutritious to eat, like <laughs> in the morning. So I mean, it, it really does feel like a big accomplishment. Yeah. Um, you know, simply having a shower, I mean, blow drying my hair, you know, putting on actual clothes. I really felt like, wow, you know, really, I'm really an accomplished person. And when you step back and think of that what I was doing, you know, prior to George's death is comical. <laughs> you know, what, sudden, what suddenly felt like a big deal in my life. But 
it was baby steps to rebuild uh, this tiny, tiny step. Yeah. I it really, cause you do feel there's just that. Yeah. That first bit of grief is just so intense and it just, yeah, it just takes over everything. So, and then how, um, you guys came back after those two months, you came back from Edinburgh. What, what was that transition going back to your flat? Did you, you had an entire nursery all put up? What did you guys do about that? That that was hard. It was because I knew it was there. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. sort of this lurking thing that we had to deal with on our return. You know, we had very kind friends that asked if we wanted them to pack everything up for us while we mm. were gone mm-hmm. and take it away. And I think it was really nice of them to offer, but it was something I really wanted to do myself. I felt quite passionate that I wanted to put away his things the way I wanted to put them away. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, even though they, he had never seen them or interacted with any of the things they were very much in my mind, George's things. Yeah. You know, I remember very early we entertained selling some of them and I just thought, absolutely not. If George didn't get to use these, no one will. Yeah. Um, And so I decided, you know, we would get a nearby storage room and I would pack everything up in, you know, neat, tidy labeled boxes. And we'd bring them to this nearby storage room where I could visit his things when I wanted, which I continue to do to this day. And I don't know, sort of ceremoniously after his funeral, I just put everything away. I think I was really adamant that I didn't want the door to his room to just be permanently shut and be this sort of awful place that no one ever went in anymore. Mm -hmm. It was really important to me to turn his room into some like a nice space where we'd want to go. So I I kind of <laughs> tore apart our living room and, and that room and I rearranged all the furniture and I turned it into this sort of, I don't know, I called it a bit of a sanctuary. Um, you know, I put a bookshelf and mm. loads of plants and a little desk where my computer is now and I spend a great deal of time in that room. There's a little area on top of the dresser where you know his ashes are and some, some of his things that I think are quite special. And... I don't know, it just sort of feels like I'm there with him. Um, I bought this this beautiful light that's like a kind of like a bonsai tree with, with um sort of pearlescent bulbs on the end and mm. I turn it on at night because I just I don't like that the room is dark at night. Oh. I like there to be a bit of ambient light in there. It just feels like there's a presence in there and so, you know, it, it probably all sounds a bit unnecessary, but but it just it makes that room feel very sort of alive and special and not this kind of terrible tomb that we just shut away forever yeah no I think that's actually a great idea to because yeah it could feel very uh so sad and it sounds like you're trying to give it a little bit of a different take a reframing of what that room is it, and and it sounds like your is it your home office kind of also where you work from it home is now yeah yeah so <laughs> it, it is um yeah so I spend I spend a great deal of time in there um you know his memory box is there it mm-hmm. sort of sits behind me on all my calls and you know, it sort of feels like I can be there with him. I, I I know people might find that hard to imagine, but I don't know. It makes me feel close to him, and and I can think of him while I'm in there, and just feel like his presence is there somehow. Yeah, it sounds very uh, like a calming place. Um, it, is. it is for you. And as you've gotten a little bit farther out, how were those days looking like? Because I think by then you were maybe our. Um, how long was your maternity leave? Like how long were you able to take off? I'm, I'm, I'm still on maternity leave. Oh, awesome. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, um, yes, un- unlike the United States, we um, very kindly got a, a year um, as a maximum. So we oh. can take a year off. I think there was, you know, some conversation with my employer that mm-hmm. you know, maybe I'd like to come back sooner, obviously. But I think it was, you know, working in the world of PR, which is uh, in client service. I just simply don't have the energy or the enthusiasm for that kind of work right now. And I think, you know, I hold myself to very high standards professionally and I know that I can't be reliable and I wouldn't do that to clients or right. to to my team. So we've worked out a different arrangement where I'm now the editor of a, a fitness website, um, which is much more part-time in terms of hours. And yeah. it's something I do on my own terms, on my own time. And, you know, if I need to disappear for a day because it's a bad day, mm-hmm. um, I'm not letting anyone down. And I think that works really well for me right now because I think, you know, while I'm worlds away from where I was last June, there are still good days and bad days. Yeah. And I think if I was having one of those bad days and we had, you know, a client that needed something, there is 
a 0% chance I could be there for them. And I think for that reason, I'm still sort of hanging on to this mat leave for as long as I can. <laughs> yeah, you might as well. I mean, like if you have the opportunity, that's great. Was that easy to, um, I guess being at home is obviously you guys were home because of COVID and then also um, being on maternity leave. Did, did that did that give you the, lug- well, I'm not saying the luxury, but did that give you the time to process everything that had happened? Because it, this is the one thing that I've learned is that stillbirth is like, it's like this big, huge shock because you're like, everything's going great. And then everything is not going great. And then you have to do all of these things. And it's just a whirlwind of things that are just sad and terrible and horrible. And then all of a sudden you stop and you're done and you're like, what just happened? And you, it's, it, I, I always felt like I was in shock. So I'm wondering, was that time good to sit and think? And how did you, how have you gone about trying to process that grief and what happened? Yeah, I think it's a really, it's a really good question. And I'm really grateful for being able to have this time. Um, I think at first it was really difficult because, you know, I'm quite a, I'm quite a high energy mm-hmm. person. You know, my job was a huge part of my life. Um, fitness and running was a big part of my life. I wrote a blog, you know, I scarcely had any free time. I was always on the move doing something. Generally, I don't deal with aimlessness very well. And so to have just shut off everything in my life that contributed to my identity was massively shocking um and it just it just completely rocked your your sense of self and it took me months to try to rebuild um the only thing i could think to do was to basically make self-care my new full-time job so i was broken and i needed to fix myself and so I needed to do everything I could to get myself in the best shape I could mentally and physically. Mm -hmm. And so I had the time. And so I've been, you know, I do things like, you know, meditate. Um, You know, I might've squeezed in like a 10 minute morning meditation in the past. I can spend one hour (laughs) doing a deep meditation now. I, I, you know, I read books voraciously. I indulged in old hobbies that I'd long forgotten. (laughs) Uh, You know, I just, I went on long walks. You know, anything I could that just felt like it was good and soothing for the soul and sort of was able to do it unapologetically Mm -hmm. because there was nobody demanding my time anymore. It took me a long time to stop feeling like I was wasting my time and started reframing that as this is like, this is is what I need to do to to get better. And I guess on top of that, also um, working with a therapist as well has been helpful. I think um, started working with a a trauma therapist. pretty much the week after George died. And I think that was extremely helpful. I know that therapy is not for everyone, but I think, you know, in managing extreme grief and shock, um, having an expert in your corner really for me was extremely helpful. Yeah. Um, I often maintain that everyone should have a therapist, you know, regardless of whether you think you have problems or not. <laughs> I, know, I was like, um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it's just for, from a self-development perspective, I think is really helpful. You know, but in the course of dealing with trauma, I think it's been particularly useful. So you know, being able to schedule those calls, you know, in the middle of the afternoon without worrying about work obligations, I think has also been really helpful in terms of my recovery. Yeah. And you had a, you have a trauma therapist. I, that's very, I, everybody was just, you know, has a counselor or a therapist and this person actually specializes in trauma. That's so interesting. Is there anything that, um, has been uh, pivotal or kind of aha moment type um, things that your therapist has brought up or helped you with? Yeah, so I think um, also a good question. So I think there's lots of different types of therapy mm-hmm. out there, and I would, would encourage people to do research if they are looking for a therapist. I think the most common type is um, CBG, so cognitive behavioral therapy, mm-hmm. which is just sort of a talking therapy, very useful. Um, what my trauma therapist does specifically is a technique called EMDR. Oh, yes. Which uh-huh. you may have heard of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which sounds completely wonky it's basically rapid eye movement while you recount traumatic experiences even saying that it sounds truly awful (laughs) I'm not going to pretend that it's not painful Um, we usually start the sessions by you know talking about what the most painful memory is and sort of getting stuck in with that Um, and it's hard it's hard work but I think perhaps like many people I was extremely skeptical at first I just thought this is completely bonkers like how can this work and, and especially how can it work through zoom <laughs> right. or, or through a video conference is it even going to be effective through a screen mm-hmm. 
and it's one of those those things where scientifically, even though there's there's enough research to show that it works, scientists aren't really in agreement about why it works, oh. um, which is interesting to me. The theories around, you know, it has to do with the way that the mind processes information similar to rapid eye movement mm-hmm. in sleep. Um, but as far as this kind of therapy goes, it's a bit inconclusive as to why it works. All they know is that it does work. So I thought... I mean, I'll give it a try. If it's completely nonsense, then I will try something else. Mm -hmm. And I think the very first, after the very first session I had, we processed George's, basically his death and then birth. And it was basically the most exhausting hour, you know, second to the actual event itself in terms of, in terms of it being traumatic. I was so tired after I remember I slept for like three hours after the call. But then the next day, we were speaking to a bereavement doula, an- another mm-hmm, person mm-hmm. in my support network, and she asked me to describe what had happened. And this was many weeks following George's death. And I remember it was the first time that I was able to talk about what had happened without just being a blubbering mess. I, I didn't cry. I finally, I could I could talk about it without it was sort of almost with a bit of space from it. It was obviously mm-hmm. still very sad, very emotional, but it was like there was just a bit of a bit of space between the event and, and how I felt. And I remember thinking straight away, like, that's really interesting. That to me seems like a direct result of the therapy we just did. Yeah. And I think I've seen that trend over and over again as we've worked together, where things that feel really intensely emotional whether it's, you know, grief or sadness or anger, they're, you know, they're just so, so debilitating almost in their intensity after our sessions. It's the, that feeling is still there, but it's not quite as explosive or all consuming that I, I can sort of engage with it if I want to right. or not. I sometimes describe it as it's like as if it's in a glass box and I can see it and say sort of, hello there, anger, <laughs> you know, and shut the, shut the door if I want, but I can also open it and go be with it if I want to. And that's, it's, it's a really difficult thing to explain, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're open to it and you have, you have the option to have a therapist who, who practices the MDR, I would highly recommend it if, if for people who have um, suffered the shock of stillbirth, for sure. My husband, Lee, actually has done EMDR off of a, another friend who had recommended it when um, she had experienced quite a, a traumatic experience in her life. And so, and he has found it extremely helpful as well. So I, <laughs> I will second your, um, your recommendation there. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm glad I don't sound like a, a nope, crazy person. It was, <laughs> he was, he came back and he's like, I am so tired. He, I remember him specifically yeah. and he would just like, I'm exhausted because you just repeat things over and over again, just to kind of, that's how he, ex- he explained it to me. And so it was, it was interesting, but he has, he felt like it was extremely very, it was very good for him. So yes. Yeah, so I second that sure. recommendation. <laughs> um, did you, so uh, it sounds like you have a great little team that has helped you through all of this. No, seriously. Like, and I was like, I don't think people realize that they need to kind of create a team to get past these, such a traumatic event, I think. And so, um, it sounds like you have, uh, a bereavement doula, a bere- um, you have your therapist, um, any other people that have have that seem to be a part of your your quote unquote team? And because I would yeah. encourage people to create a team like that. I think that is a great way to put it. Is like you need help to get out of this where you're at right now. And you need I people. I would agree a hundred percent. I know. I mean, even in the earliest days, if you had told me, you know, go find different elements of support, you know, I would have. I I was you know still very much in a state of I'm a victim and everything yeah. is hopeless. And I think, I think it's okay to be there for a little bit, but not forever. But as soon as I started, you know, kind of, I don't know, taking a bit of control, I guess, you know, or feeling like I needed to, being able to sort of collect all these experts in my network to help me, um, you know, I sort of created this little army of, of people to assist me who all have different areas of expertise. So you mentioned, obviously, the, the doula and um, my therapist, I think another one was the bereavement midwife who was assigned yes. to us at the hospital. I mean, we didn't have a choice about who that was. And so I think we maybe just got quite lucky because she's turned out to be um, a huge source of support, even, you know, almost 11 months on, we're yeah. still in touch. And I don't know if that's ordinary for her or not, but 
she's she's been amazing any question i have about quite literally anything she is just an email or phone call away which um has been you know just a, you know just nice to have a person like that in your life i also investigated quite a few um support groups for mm-hmm. baby loss mm-hmm. which due to covid um any of the in person support groups were canceled so again much like my therapy i was skeptical that the digital version would do the trick <laughs> yeah <laughs> um <laughs> But I think I was pleasantly surprised to find, at least in the early days, there's a baby loss charity called Sands um, mm-hmm. that held a, a monthly meeting on Zoom that I joined for the first couple of months after George's death. And they were hugely helpful because I think um, they it's run by people, mostly women, who have lost babies, but they're many, many years on from that loss. Uh, many have gone on to have at least one or several other children. Mm-hmm. Um, the one woman who led most of the calls lost a baby, you know, something like 22 years ago. So, I mean, she's quite a long way on that journey. Yeah. And I think I found speaking to those people extremely helpful and hopeful. Um, because I think what I found with some of the online um, forums and Facebook pages mm-hmm. is that it's too many people who are in the midst of their own grief, people who have lost babies, you know, yesterday or a week ago or a month ago. And it was just, stories of tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And while there is some, you know, sort of camaraderie in that, and it's an element where you sort of don't feel as alone, it also fuels your anxiety because it feels like this happens all the time. Yeah. And it's like, I suddenly know a thousand ways a baby can die. I thought, you know, this was a rare occurrence and it's like every possible disaster that could happen has happened. And I don't think that those forums had anything to offer me because it's not anyone supporting each other. It's just everyone talking about their own grief. And so for me, the best thing was the the groups where people were much further on in that journey and could talk to me from a a more hopeful future place. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, I eventually connected with one of the women from the charity who lived nearby who lost a baby boy in a similar situation to George, but eight years ago. And she's gone on to have two two boys since then. And we've gone for walks and we talk on WhatsApp. And I ask her lots of questions about, you know, what did you do about this? And when this happened, how did you react? And, you know, I know there's no rule book for how to deal with the death of your child. But I think to just have somebody who, who when they say, I, I get it, you know that they really sincerely do to tell you what they did, I think is, is been a huge source of comfort. That is great. I I I have found that I we've gravitated towards the people that have are a little farther out, um, especially at the very beginning because you're like I just don't think I'm gonna be able, be okay and you look okay <laughs> like it's like you look okay okay we might be able to do this so I think that was it it's like you seem like a normal functioning kid yeah who has you know two healthy kids and you know you're still sad about your baby and I see that because you know I met this particular woman. Um, the place where we decided to meet the first time was at her son's memorial tree. Oh, uh-huh. you know, so we looked at it and, you know, she's a runner. So she ran there. I ran there. You know, we met. Well, it was just, it was all very, just felt very appropriate. And yeah, and I think, you know, I get quite prickled when, you know, people say comments to me like, oh, I know how you feel. It's like, mm. I, you know, you may have an idea of what grief is like, but you don't know how this particular thing feels. And unless you are, of course, this woman who I've connected with, who has very much been in my situation. When she says stuff like that, I think you do actually know. Yeah. <laughs> and I believe you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you've come out the other side and seem to be a, you know, functioning, contributing member of society <laughs> who actually appears happy. And I find that quite hopeful. Yeah. Yes, it is very hopeful. And, and we need that at the very beginning. I think we need that. Definitely. Um, and you have, you were a very big runner, a very big, uh, you, you were in the fitness industry. And it sounded like the the running had kind of pittered off for you for a while there. It did. I think I have a very complicated relationship with exercise these days. When I was pregnant with George, I had a real chip on my shoulder, I think, about not letting the pregnancy impact my very sort of rigid and high intensity fitness Mm -hmm. routine for as long as possible. Um, You know, I wasn't determined to do anything unsafe of course but I was very adamant that I was going to continue you know being as fit and active as I could be and maintaining that same level of activity for as long as I felt I could you know I ran a half marathon when I was six weeks pregnant I continued going to Orange Theory 
you know, mm-hmm. classes until I was they shut because of COVID, but until I was, you know, 20 weeks pregnant. In hindsight, I think those things were too much. And there is an element of me that believes that that level of intensity, especially in the early days, contributed to George's death. I know practically that that's not true. Um, you know, I've asked multiple medical professionals if excessive exercise can cause what caused his death, um, which was growth restriction. And they all say no, um, that, you know, that wouldn't have been the cause at all. Mm-hmm. Um, even when I wanted to run that half marathon, I remember asking my GP if it was okay. And the, the rule of thumb was essentially that, you know, if you were fit before and you were training for this before you got pregnant, you know, and you feel okay, carry on. But I think I know in my heart, there were many, many times where I pushed it when I didn't feel okay. Oh, okay. Um, because I think I just, I felt like I had a point to prove. And so after, after everything, I think, you know, there was a period where I was almost sort of using exercise to punish myself a little bit, like mm. forcing myself to try and get back into this fitness routine, both because, you know, I needed to get back to where I was as quickly as possible, but also because I think, you know, my body was a reminder of loss. You know, I think all through pregnancy, people tell you, and they certainly told me that when, you know, when you are pregnant, that, you know, all the changes to your body is worth it. Um, That, you know, yes, you know, you might gain weight and you'll be a little softer and, you know, you might not be physically where you were, but it'll all be worth it. And I think that's really only true if you get to take your baby home with you. Uh, Because when you don't, um, your body is just a reminder of how much it failed you and how it just catastrophically let you down. And I hated myself for it. I hated it. I hated looking at myself. Every time I did, it was just a reminder of how of, of how I failed. And so I started exercising a lot to try and just get back to where I was so I didn't have to constantly remind myself every time I looked in the mirror. Yeah. I think I'm past that in a much healthier place now, but running is still hard for me. Because, I mean, it's a high-intensity activity, um, and I just never kind of fell in love with it again. I'm not as possessed by it as I once was, mm-hmm. and it's hard, too, because it was such a big part of my identity. Um, you know, I, I ran because I was a runner. It's who I was. And when you don't do that anymore, it's really, who are you? So I'm I'm reevaluating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find different ways of staying active that are more about feeling good and feeling healthy than they are about sort of, you know, beasting myself in the gym, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which I think was perhaps maybe where I was bordering on before was just like, it was always like harder, faster, heavier, you know, always. Otherwise it wasn't good enough. It was a waste of time. And I think I really need to reframe that, you know, sometimes actually just like a walk outside is is fine. Yeah. (laughs) Also exercise. Yeah. You don't need to be dripping and sweating on the verge of vomiting for it to count. So it's it's hard work. This is a hard area of my life. And it probably sounds trivial to some people who might be listening to this compared to everything else. But it's I, I'm reworking my relationship with it. Yeah. I, well, I understand where where you're coming from, just because like when you do feel like, well, there's a couple of things when you feel like your body has betrayed you and, and taking care of your your child. Right. Like that that in itself is. A one issue <laughs> that I've dealt with myself. And then the other issue is that, you know, there was a, there was the, the winter before, and then there's the winter after, right? Like it's the Miranda before and the, the Miranda after. And it feels like now that you're, I, I feel like that I'm a new person, like I'm a different person. Something's different yeah. about me because of my, this, this little event that ha- little big event that happened in my life. And so, and I'm just, I don't know if I, like, I always feel like, can I go back to that person that was kind of innocent and, and did all these things? It, you, there's like associations with that old self that sometimes are like, Oh, that's, that's not who I am anymore. So just interesting. I, I, I understand that. I feel like I often now divide my life into, you know, before, before George and mm-hmm. after. Um, I, I look at photos sometimes of myself from, you know, from several years ago. And I think, you know, I don't even know that person. Yeah. Who is that? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, and sometimes it's, that makes me really sad. I get quite nostalgic, you know, for that sort of easy ignorance that I kind of lived my life with, you know, this very privileged life where I'd never experienced really anything that bad. 
I just assumed that I never would. Um, and it's it's hard now. It's hard now to imagine a life where, you know, part of my identity, you know, maybe doesn't include the word runner and instead it includes the word bereaved parent. That's not really what I wanted to add yeah. to, to the list of words that describe me. But it's part of part of my identity now. So it's it's a work in progress. Yeah. We all are works in progress and it's ah, oh, yeah. It's frustrating when you're like, oh, this is not what I planned it to be, or this is not what I envisioned my life to be like. And so, but we, is this happens and it, it is what it is. I know that um, it sounds like Graham has been a huge support to you. And I'm wondering if you saw a difference between how you guys grieved the loss of George um, in, in this last year. Yeah, definitely. I think, well, I mean, anyone that, you know, has, has has been through this or um, has done any research or looked up anything related to grief. I mean, I think it's very common understanding that men and women grieve very differently. Um, my firsthand experience is that that is extremely true. <laughs> um, I think in the early days, Graham basically fell into kind of autopilot mode. Mm -hmm. um, he realized that I couldn't handle basically anything. And he took it on himself to manage all of the practicalities and the administrative stuff um, around George's death. I think people, I think, often don't realize that there is actually kind of a lot of admin associated with the death of someone. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to register the death with the council and you've got to, you know, fill out all this paperwork. And, um, you know, on the, the more personal side, you know, there was loads of family members that had to be informed and communicated with. And um, they knew not to contact me um, because Graham told them not to. And also my phone was off for weeks. Yeah. But I think it was, it was quite troubling for people to not be able to see or speak to me in those early days, or at least I've heard from others that they were quite, because I just disappeared. They didn't know how I was. And so Graham took on the role of chief communications officer. Mm. You know, he, he managed every incoming communication from family and friends regardless of what the questions were and it was a full-time job um it was a lot of work yeah he shielded me from a lot of stuff um I mean and terribly around the same time many of our close friends were also expecting babies mm. and you know he very carefully kind of managed the details around that you know making sure that I wouldn't see anything or hear anything as much as he could it still happened of course but trying his best or trying to do it in the most sensitive way possible and I think when when the bulk of that was done, which arguably took many, many months, mm -hmm. I think it was only then that he started realizing that he hadn't really actually processed anything around George's death. <laughs> um, he, you know, he started, you know, he had, he had nightmares. It was very unusual for him. Um, his job was, was quite stressful at the time. And I think, you know, he just, he was, he was a bit burnt out. Um, but he's a, he's a problem solver um, and he's extremely resourceful. And so I think he recognized, you know, that this was a problem and also is, is self-aware enough to know that, you know, he, he needed some, something, he needed help of some kind. Mm -hmm. And so he also um, found a therapist who he worked with, certainly not as long as I've been, but for, I think, a, you know, six weeks or so of sessions. And I think he found that really useful. That's good. And I think in all of it, I think we just stayed really close in terms of communicating with each other, which I know is quite hard for some couples. Um, you know, maybe if communication wasn't the strong point in the relationship before, uh, throwing a crisis into the mix doesn't usually help. Yeah. So I'm very grateful that we were probably already decent communicators in the mm -hmm. first place. I think that helps. He's also just relentlessly optimistic like to a ridiculous point where sometimes I'm like, I just want you to say things suck. <laughs> like, you know, why, why can't you just agree for five seconds? You know, he's constantly looking on the bright side and sometimes it's infuriating when <laughs> you feel like the world is just closing in on you and you just want somebody to just sit with you and just tell you like, yes, it is, it is all bad. But lo most times it was what I needed to hear. And he just, he never gave up on me. I think it would have been really easy to give up on me because I wasn't a good version of myself for a long time. Um, so, and he just, I don't know, he just kept, he kept, he just kept on being supportive and his amazingly optimistic self. And he was always positive for our future, which I think 
helped both him and I. Yeah. Um, and he's also passionate about sort of self-development as well. And I think, you know, encouraging, you know, us to do things together, like, you know, like meditate or do, you know, self-improvement, you mm-hmm. know, online courses or, um, you know, stuff that we could do together like that, where it was both good for him and good for me. So, you know, I, th- I think, you know, if I could summarize it, it's probably that, you know, his grieving process is very kind of practical, very, yeah. there is a problem and I would solve it. Yeah. And I think that's very ordinary um, or common, I should say, for, for men to assume that role. Mm-hmm. I think from, from what I read and what I hear, it sounds like lots of men do that, but that it does often mean that they don't process their emotions and they do bubble up down the road. Um, that may still happen. And I think he's very aware that that may still happen. Mm-hmm. But my hope is that if it does, I will be in a place where I can support him. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> I owe him. <laughs> yeah. We all owe our spouses like you big time. Yeah, exactly. He sounds, uh, you guys sound like you have done very well uh, trying to stick close together and to support each other when the other person may be not at their best. So that's, yeah. Uh, I hope so. I think if there's any silver lining of anything, I think that it's our relationship has remained good. Um, you know, certainly not been without its its challenges, mm-hmm, but for sure. um, I know that in lots of situations where a baby's died, it often uh, brings couples to the end of their relationship. And that's just another layer of tragedy on top of an already very trying situation. And I'm very thankful that that didn't, that wasn't the case for us. Yeah. I sincerely don't know how I could have managed if, if things went a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to jump over and just um, talk about anything that you do specifically to remember George. I know you have your office that is kind of a, a space that you get to remember him and his, his um, remains are there as well. Are there any other physical things that you have that you, that remind you of him or you try to bring into your life so that you, you can, you're reminded of him? There are lots of things. I think I'm quite like a like a sentimental person. Mm-hmm. I like mm-hmm. physical things to sort of look at or like touch and feel. And I think, you know, in the absence of a lifetime of memories with a person, um, it's really hard to do that for a baby that you, know, you didn't get a chance to get to know. But one of the, the big things, and I was very convinced by this very early on that I wanted it, um, we had a memorial bench installed um, oh. on the river outside our house. Uh, in London, which um, is this, you know, sort of kilometer long, maybe mile long river. Um, and I spent endless hours walking on that river when I was pregnant. Um, you know, I imagined one day walking on it with George and, you know, feeding ducks with him and, you know, spending sunny summer days sitting in the grass and, you know, have really fond memories of walking there. And I, I always look at the memorial benches that are already there. I like reading them and thinking mm-hmm. of the people that have died and that they're remembered. And so I thought, well, we have to get a bench for George because I think having him cremated means we don't have a gravestone or somewhere to go and sort of right. visit. Mm-hmm. And so the bench now becomes that place for me where if I'm feeling like I want to go and be with him, I can sit on his bench and think of him. Um, maybe fortunately or unfortunately, I picked what I perceive to be the best spot on the river for the bench. Um, so the bench is almost always occupied. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, especially when it's sunny. So every time I think I'm going to go sit on George's bench, there's usually someone there. But that also puts a smile on my face yeah. because it means that somebody's read his name and they're thinking of him. Next to his bench, we also had a tree planted mm-hmm. um, because I really liked the idea that, you know, if he can't grow big and strong, then the tree can for him. Mm-hmm. Um, the tree is a maple tree, which, you know, is sort of a Canadian, a, a, you know, nod to his right. Canadian parents. <laughs> and yeah, it just sort of, I think it's just a nice sort of thing. Every time I leave the flat, and, you know, I can, I can see it there. And I think, you know, people often said, you know, if you move away from London, will you be sad? And I just thought, no. Because I think, you know, it's this thing that will stay there forever. And yeah. anyone that passes by will see this beautiful tree with this beautiful bench and they'll read his name and they'll think of him. And in terms of keeping his memory alive, I think that felt very important to me. So it took it took a long time and many emails with the, <laughs> with the local council to get that sorted. But um, it was finally installed in November. Of oh, year. wonderful. Not not the best time in London for an outdoor bench. It was basically a mud pit for three months. <laughs> never, <laughs> never mind. But it's been done. So I think that's so that's so sweet. I yeah. yeah. Any other things that think, you want to share? 
Um, a few other things. I don't know if any of my friends or family will listen to this, so this, so this might come as a surprise to them. Um, but both Graham and I got tattoos. <laughs> remember George? Surprise, everybody! Um, yeah, which we didn't tell anyone. I mean, they're not they're not no 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 overtly yeah. you know sort of crazy full back tattoos. Yeah. Um, mine is uh, on my wrist. It's just a little uh, lowercase letter G, where the tail loops up into a heart that looks like a balloon. Uh, and Graham's is the same. Uh, it's just on a, on his forearm instead of his wrist. And I don't know. I just I look at it all the time. And sometimes, like the sleeve of my shirt just just shows a little balloon like poking out. And I just oh. I don't know. Every time I look at it, it just makes me think of of him. And the little G was because well, we were sometimes referring to him as little G, but <laughs> Graham was the big G, and George was. The oh, G. that's so sweet. <laughs> um, and it's it's small and it's subtle. And for me, it was important because. I wanted something visible on my body that people might ask me about Uh um, because then it gives me a reason to talk about him again, especially to people who may not have ever even known he existed. Um, And this was something we came up with in the days, you know, in early June following his death. Mm -hmm. And we were both very convinced that we would do this as soon as, again, as soon as COVID allowed tattoo parlors to open again. (laughs) Um, So we snuck in there in November just in time before they (laughs) shut for five months. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I mean, the tattoo is so simple. It took all of about 30 seconds to put on my body. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It's, um, and I mean, for anyone that knows me, I was very, not, not opposed to tattoos, but I was very much the person that was never, ever going to get one. I could never possibly think of anything important enough to put on my body forever. This, this seemed like the thing. The most, yeah, important enough there. So I want to go into this. I this is one of my favorite parts of uh, the, this part of the interview is that I like to know what people have um, done and said that were so helpful to you. That you're like, if you're going to say somebody something to somebody that has lost a baby, then this is something that you might want to consider. Let's just talk about some of those things that people did or said that were sure. you felt extremely helpful for you. Yeah, sure. I think, um, I think, and I I said this to friends and family at the beginning, because, you know, one of the things they often said was, you know, what can we do? (laughs) You know, they wanted, they wanted us to come up with the things that they could do to support us. And that was really hard, um, because we had no idea. Uh, And we didn't have any idea for a long, long time. Uh, But I think the things that helped the most was just to check in with us regularly. Mm -hmm. And instead of asking you know, let me know what I can do to help you. The people that said things like, I'm going to call you on Tuesday next week and check in with you. Or let's have a call every Thursday morning and just chat. That was so, I know it sounds like the simplest thing on earth, but having having A, someone else make the executive decision on that was helpful at a time where I was incapable of basically even feeding myself. And the other thing was is that there was an appointment to keep me accountable for. It was something to yeah. look forward to when everything else in my life had evaporated. Um, because the worst thing was feeling like everyone had forgotten about us or that, you know, they'd sent their obligatory I'm so sorry message and disappeared. The people that stayed close and connected to us long after the initial days and weeks following George's death were invaluable to me. And they didn't have to do much. I mean... I think there was this real sort of sense with people that they had to had to say the perfect thing or um, mm. say something that takes away the pain, and I, I, I it's the fool's errand because it was impossible. Yes, um, there was nothing that could have made me feel better, but the single best thing people did was just to just to check in, <laughs> and when they asked how I was and I said I was terrible, to just be okay with listening to how terrible I really was. Yeah. Um, and not try to sugarcoat it or make it sound better or look for a silver lining or, you know, I don't know, try to just take away that pain um, just to allow, allow me to be sad. Um, I think that was that was really nice. On a more practical side, I think, you know, some people sent food, which I think can be really nice. But I think, you know, <laughs> I think I said this to you before, there's only so many frozen lasagnas that, you know, a girl, a girl can eat. Um <laughs> It, it was very helpful to have things to kind of add the ready that yes. you could make, especially in the early days when I could, couldn't cook anything. And I didn't want, you know, obviously the lion's share of the work to fall to Graham. 
um, that was helpful. I would just say maybe check in with the rest of your friends and family and make sure you're not overloading the poor person with food. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think the other thing was when people actually asked me about George, people were so afraid to talk about him, um, to even say his name. And for the very brave friends and family that, that tried, <laughs> I'm really thankful to them because one thing I think people don't necessarily realize is that, uh, that you know, the, the mother of the baby that died still had a baby. Yeah. And I think there was a part of me that still really wanted to talk about him. And nobody asks you all the normal questions they ask somebody when they've had a baby. You know, nobody asked me what the birth was like or, you know, why we picked the name we did. And for the few people that did bravely venture into that territory, I will be forever thankful for them. I think for anyone listening, if you're worried about asking those questions to a friend or a family member that's lost a baby, maybe just start by asking if it's okay if you ask a question. Um, you know, some people said things like, is it okay if I ask you about George? Or would you like to tell me about George's birth? And I think being able to make that decision myself and either say, yes, I do want to tell you about this or no, I don't was really helpful. Uh, it was certainly much more helpful than people just saying, I'm so sorry. And I can't imagine how you feel. Bye. <laughs> and, you know, good luck with your grief. I'll talk to you when you're better. Right. Yeah, that Which, and, and I, I don't mean to sorry, I don't mean to trivialize those sorts of messages. I think people they were doing the best they could mm -hmm. with the words they had available to them. Um, I definitely don't expect people to know the right thing to say is really hard. Um, I wouldn't have known the right thing to say to me either. In fact, I probably would have used a lot of those phrases for lack of even any experience with grief myself before George's death. But I think if I could say anything that was helpful is just to not be afraid to mention the baby, the baby's name, and to allow the family to talk, to, uh, to speak about that baby without being visibly uncomfortable or, or try to shut it down because it's too sad. Yeah. We just want to talk about our kids, right? I think that of is, course. it's so like, and, and there's, uh, there's a sense of pride of being able to say that I birthed, you know, I birthed my child. That is like, a big deal. And you're right. People don't ask about the details. I, I remember um, a good friend of mine, she, she was dropping off some food after we lost our son. And she's like, can I ask you a question? Can you tell me, like, tell me about the birth? And I was like, yeah, yeah. I want to talk about that. Cause it's, yeah, it's, it's a big, it's in itself a big accomplishment to have given birth. I, and it was your first time think, too, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And I, I think people don't know if they should because they're so afraid of of upsetting mm -hmm. the grieving person and i i get that i do because the worst thing someone would feel is if they just cause you more pain and upset you more but i think and i don't want to speak for everyone but i i think for me the thing that was most painful was feeling like i couldn't talk about it yeah was having to pretend that george never existed because it was too uncomfortable for other people and that just is another layer of just insult to injury with the loss of a baby is that not only are you grieving and, and going through shock and dealing with this tremendous tragedy, you feel like you have to do it alone because it's too horrifying for anyone else to engage with. Yeah. And I think for those brave friends that allowed me to talk to them about something that was truly their worst nightmare, I will be very thankful to them forever because, you know, those moments were really important to me. And for the ones that just ask me the normal questions about, you know, giving birth and having a baby and didn't make me feel like I was invalidated from being a mom, I think, you know, that, hmm. that's really important. Yeah, that is so, so important. Um, I want to bring up one thing that you mentioned. We've talked about um, your friend before, and she was the one that actually referred you to us. And I, you said something about what she did, and I want you to repeat it again because she, um, because I think that it was really great. She did something that was like kind of out of the ordinary, right? She found a podcast and said, hey, I'm just trying to understand where you're coming from. And she yeah. um, did something that was a little different. I'm not saying like, <laughs> join our community if you want to, but I, she did something that was, um, she was just trying to understand wh what you were experiencing. And that is huge, yeah. I think. I think I had a couple of friends who I think displayed a 
extremely evolved um, level of emotional mm-hmm. intelligence in that fact, you know, sort of realizing that they have no idea about what I might be going through and in an effort to try and help me found podcasts like yours or read the book mm-hmm. about baby loss so that they were better equipped to have those com- excuse me conversations. Um, I mean, that, that to me is kind of a next level of grief support um, that I wouldn't expect most people are capable of, of doing. But this particular friend, yeah, found was basically looking for ways to understand something that she had no no uh, ability to understand or no sort of uh, anything in her life that was similar. And I think, you know, for that reason, she was able to just so much more easily talk to me about things because she suddenly realized what was okay to ask and not ask or just felt a bit empowered to be able to even talk to me at all. Uh, and I think, you know, her and her husband were hugely supportive in the in the early days and was making sure that they mentioned George, remembered his milestone, mm-hmm. you know, every second of the month, you know, sending a message saying they were thinking of him, lighting a candle for him. I mean, people don't have to do that. That's, you know, that's above and beyond. But for the ones that did, it meant the world to me. Yeah, I think that I just think, oh, you're so lucky to have good friends, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Having I think friends. it was, I mean, in the absence of also being able to see anyone in person because of the lockdown, which was seemingly endless, yeah. um, that was also a huge help because I think it was very easy to be in, in brief to isolate yourself and obviously very easy to isolate yourself in a lockdown. Um, and I think quite easy to be forgotten in the midst of, you know, everyone else is struggling and suffering right. too, to a degree. Completely you know I think it's easy to get caught up in your own world as well and so for those that kind of put their own troubles aside and you know remember to send me a text message or you know or took the time to listen to a podcast or read a book I mean I really I I can't say enough about how much that meant to me um so I think you know if people are listening and you know it's something you feel capable of doing I I really would encourage it as hard as it is this is a hard topic it's it's heavy it's not easy yeah but if you can do that and allow and educate yourself to be better for your friend or your family, they will, they will notice. Yes. They will notice. Yes. There's so few people that do that above and beyond those things. So, and on the flip side, um, are there some things that you would probably recommend not saying and or doing that were maybe that graded on you or kind of made you mad or anything like that? Because those are the things that I, I think people want to try and avoid. Sure. Um, yeah, let, let's hear what and anything that in particular that. There, there are a few things and I think there, are, I, I may offer subtle adjustments. To oh, okay. Things, okay. Yes. Um, let's hear. That, we always like those. It <laughs> will help people. So, um, and I, I mentioned this before, but I think one of the most common phrases that we heard, which was the sign off to virtually every text message and email that we received was, let me know if there's anything I can do to help. I hate that phrase. Yeah, (laughs) I know that phrase comes from a place of good. And please, if any friends and family are listening, and you said this to me, I this is not me (laughs) saying you did the wrong thing. But I think it was it was impossible for me to ever let you know what you could do to help because a I had no idea mm-hmm. and b even if I had the capacity to come up with something I already felt so vulnerable already the last thing I was going to do was to reach out to somebody and say please can you do this for me right I just I just simply wouldn't have done it and I think for the friends and family who instead just took the executive decision and said hey I'm going to do this thing <laughs> you tell me if this is helpful or not exponentially more helpful. So even small things like I'm going to call you next Tuesday or we're going to send you a food bundle that's going to arrive on this day. Or, you know, we've, I don't know, booked you an appointment for something at this place. Mm -hmm. It it doesn't really matter what it is. Um, Obviously it depends on the person that you're speaking to. I mean, you would know your, your grieving person best, but I think allow them to tell you yes or no, instead of putting the onus on them to, come up with the solution for you yes um that was hard for me because it felt like sort of a throwaway comment where it was just like all right well I've put the offer out there and if I don't hear from them I guess I don't need to do anything now and in a lot of situations that was the last I ever heard from people Mm -hmm. and again this is not this is not to you know to say that they've done the wrong thing but 
I think for those that tried, <laughs> you know, and, and just, you know, made an effort to come up with a solution was a lot more helpful in the early days. Yeah. I think now I'm much better at saying, you know, what it is I want or don't want, but that's only with the benefit of, you know, 11 months of, of even understanding my own triggers and my own, my own heart really. So I think that's one thing. Yes. Um, the other one that you know, this is a very, this is quite a sensitive one, but one of the things that happened really frequently and continues to happen is um, a lot of friends or women in my network shared stories of their own loss, mostly um, earlier or early, maybe early or late miscarriages mm -hmm. or some, something like that. And I think on the one hand, you know, I, I think I know that people share those stories um, as a way to relate and you know try to help me feel less alone. Um, you know, to show that they have some experience with loss in a way. But I think I would just caution people to be a bit careful about the way they share those stories with somebody who's experienced a stillbirth. I might suggest instead that you ask if they want to hear about your story first before you just unload your story on them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, say, would it be okay if I told you about my own baby loss story? Or would you like to hear about my experience with mis miscarriage? Um, because I think there was a time where I, I did want to hear those stories and I was receptive to them. But there was also a lot of time where I definitely was not. And to be blindsided with those stories is just a message in your inbox or, you know, a, me a Facebook messenger message from someone, you know, that I hadn't spoken to in many years. Mm -hmm. It was, re it's tough <laughs> because then I feel like I need to then offer empathy and support when mm. I, I don't have a lot to give right now <laughs> on yeah. that front. And equally, I don't have any experience with miscarriage. So I don't want to pretend like my, my situation is, is the same similar to the way I would hope that they wouldn't necessarily think that theirs is the same comments that really prickled me were when people had experienced an early miscarriage who said things like I know exactly how you feel or I've been there and I thought to myself you haven't been there at all this is not the same thing at all and while there are elements of, of shared grief there there are some similarities in that story or our stories I often try to use the analogy sometimes with people that it's like it's like telling someone in a wheelchair that you understand what it's like to be paralyzed because you broke your leg once. Like you might understand what it's like to be inconvenienced by crutches, but you most certainly don't know what it's like to be paralyzed. Yeah. And maybe that's a crude analogy, but I feel like it's it's similar in a way and that I any loss of course is is tragic and there are there are similarities in the grief that accompany it. But I think I would just caution women who have experienced a miscarriage to just tread a bit carefully when you share those stories with someone who's had a, a late term loss, um, because the experiences are quite different. Yeah. So um, just to maybe ask first if they want to hear that story. Yes. Yeah. That is, that's a good way to do it. And just letting people know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I, th I think that was all I wanted to say on that. <laughs> okay, perfect. Any other, um, uh, it sounds like, uh, keep going. Let's hear Let's hear some more things that you would prefer. I, think, sorry, I do know one other thing. The, the last thing was, I think, I think phrases along the lines of, you know, this happened for a reason, or it was God's will, or you will, you will realize down the road why this happened, or it'll make you a better person, or any comment that seemed to suggest that there was a reason why George died, some grand design by mm -hmm. the universe, really rattled me. Yeah. <laughs> um, to, it, it rattled me because it made me feel like if I don't change my life radically or do something grand, like, I don't know, devote my life to placenta research or open the wing of a hospital and name it after George, that I've somehow missed the point of his death. And <sighs> I, I suddenly felt this enormous pressure to do something grand that if I wasn't, then I was, I was messing this up somehow. This notion that there's this God that's just sort of doling out you know, punishment like this is, it's just not a helpful thing to say. And even though that may be your belief and that's perfectly within your right to have it, I think those comments might be better, better kept to yourself. And there's no doubt that, you know, having a stillbirth or any sort of loss changes you in a way. And lots of people's lives do change quite dramatically as a result. But that's a symptom. That's, or that's an outcome. That's 
information that wasn't a strategy by the universe. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think I would just basically eliminate those phrases um, from anything. <laughs> just get rid of them. <laughs> They're just not helpful. They They are not helpful at all. And they just... Yep. And they just kind of make you feel uh, the, lo- the lost parent makes you, they just feel worse. <laughs> yeah. It's just a lot of pressure. And I, I know that again, I, I do just want to say that I know that all of these things come from a place of good. Anyone that said things like this to me, I never, I, I didn't, I didn't get mad. I, you know, I, no, I'm no. not mad. I just think there are in, in hindsight and with the benefit of experience and, and, time to reflect on this there there are different things that would have been more helpful and so I think if this helped someone say better things <laughs> to someone who is grieving in the future that makes me feel like George's life had had impact yeah exactly thank you so much Miranda this has been such a enlightening conversation I would like to ask you though one last thing is there anything that any last bit, bit of a device that you would want to give to lost moms, lost dads, and, and maybe those who are supporting them or helping them? I think for the, those that are supporting them, I think one thing I'd just like to leave people with is to just, if you can, try to get a bit comfortable with sadness. I know that sounds mm. weird, but we have this sort of cultural notion that you know sadness is bad um, and that we have to make it go away. And if there's a sad person, we have to get away because it's, it's like it's contagious or something. But all that really does is make the grieving person feel more lonely yeah. and feel like you have to just grieve in silence. And all these things happen in your mind while you're alone and you feel like you can't talk to anyone about it. And then there's a period of time that goes by where we've decided that the prerequisite time in which a grieving person can be grieving. But after that, we then close the door on that and you're normal and you're fine and we never speak of it again. And honestly, I think that it is one of the most damaging ways to treat grief. As a society, as a, mm-hmm. as a human race, we have to get better at this because pe- everyone is going to experience some kind of loss in their life. It, no, it's not going to be you know, the loss of a baby. Um, but a parent or grandparent or close friend, I mean, and, and there are similarities in that grief. And broadly, I would say we are terrible at yes. supporting people. Mm-hmm. So I don't think you need to say the right thing or be obsessed about saying the right thing. You don't even really need to say anything. I think it's just to be okay being sad with yeah. that person and just allowing them to be sad in your presence and not shy away from that the way that we so routinely do um, because it's uncomfortable. Because that's, that is the best thing you can do is to really just sit in the sad with them (laughs) yeah it's so Um, comforting yeah when somebody's okay just being there with you yeah and I mean for parents I mean I don't know that I have any nuggets of wisdom necessarily I still feel like I'm early in this journey myself but I think you know the thing that everyone tells you in the beginning is that even though it doesn't feel possible things will get better and I know that if you're listening to this and you're in the early stages you you probably don't believe that and or maybe you do but you think it's an impossibly long future ahead or time ahead but it is true I mean time time does help it never goes away I think that's maybe the thing is that um you know you don't get get over grief Mm -hmm. or, or even get through it I think you just find ways to live alongside it and I think you know maybe that's a grim prospect but My hope is that, you know, that I can think of George and remember, remember him without that sort of, you know, kind of searing pain that's accompanied so much of this, because I think, you know, his, his life, you know, had, had major impact, you know, not just on me, but I think, you know, people who know us and know, know know of him, I think we keep his memory alive and that, that feels important. Thank you so much, Miranda. This was so good to to hear from you and to hear your words of advice because they were they were helpful to me too. But thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me.